Chancellor, we, well, uh, we come to the conferment of our first honorary graduand. Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, I have the very great honour to introduce to you Tony Fernandez, CBE, the Chief Executive Officer of Air Asia. Tony Fernandez flies in the face of that old gag about how to make a million pounds. They say it's easy. It's easy to make a million pounds. You take a billion pounds and then you start an airline. He did it the other way around. He bought a failing airline with two aircraft for one Malaysian ringgit, which is about 20 pence. Within one year, he had cleared the debts of the airline and within three years, launched it on the stock exchange, valued at $100 million. Today, it operates over 200 aircraft with more than 300 on order. It carries over 60 million passengers. It employs 20,000 people, or all stars, as he calls them. And it has been voted the best low-cost airline in the world for the last nine years. Tony believes in grabbing opportunities, and he likes to see where they will take him. If he didn't have that character, he wouldn't have ended up working as the third relief organ player for the Boston Red Sox baseball team when he went on what might now be described as a gap year. Tony has three passions, music, sport, and aviation. In each field, he has, a, has had a significant impact on the industry. He was the chief executive officer of Warner Music in Malaysia, and since making Air Asia a success, he has started a Formula One racing team, and he is the owner chairman of Queen's Park Rangers Football Club in the UK. My buddy Ian is a lifelong supporter of QPR, and he tells me that they will get back into the premiership next year. And I believe him, and I believe him because if you can learn anything from the life of Tony Fernandez, it is that passion, commitment, tenacity, and perseverance will mean that Tony is likely to achieve the goals that he sets for himself and those that work with him. Tony's parents worked hard to send him from Kuala Lumpur to school in Surrey. Aged 12 years of age, Tony, football mad Tony's uh, main concern about flying halfway around the world by himself to go to a boarding school in a foreign land was that the school played rugby and not football. His mother travelled regularly for work and Tony associated air travel with family reunions at airports. He loved that air travel brings people together. And he was devastated that the cost of a flight was so high that he was unable to fly home from school in England to Malaysia when his beloved mother became ill and passed away. He vowed there and then that he would make it so that everybody could afford to fly. After qualifying as an accountant, he, was, he desperately wanted a job in the music business, but he fluffed an interview with Virgin Music. However, a chance meeting with Richard Branson on the way out of the interview changed things. Gro Tony grabbed the opportunity to talk to Branson, who saw potential in him and gave him a chance, a lesson learned that Tony has used throughout his career. Recruit somebody who fits the culture of the company and they will find a role within it. The remarkable story of Air Asia's success is made even more remarkable when you hear that he secured ownership of the airline just two days before the terror attacks of 9-11 in 2001. The worst time in history to be starting an airline and that within the first few months of operations, a bird, bird strike cut the airline's fleet by half. One of its two aircraft was non-operational for 11 days uh, as it was repaired. The Air Asia All Stars worked round the clock to ensure that every service was operated and no passengers were left behind. The airline was further challenged by the SARS epidemic of 2002 and the financial crisis of 2008 but the airline has continued to grow into the success it is today. 
As someone new to the airline industry, Tony really learnt the business from the ground up. He's worked every job in the airline, from ramp agent and check-in staff to cabin crew and pilot. Yes, he even learned to fly in his spare time. Tony has disrupted the airline industry in Asia and led his airline to success. His management style is open, honest, and transparent. Tony, I expect, will tell you that he wasn't a great student and that he found the best education is not stuffy and formal or from theory, but by learning, by doing in the real world, as he has done at Air Asia. To my mind, that is very close to the Cranfield philosophy, that of being close to industry and designed to provide real-world solutions to complex challenges in technology, operations, and management. And so, Chancellor, I am authorised by the Council and Senate to ask you to confer on Mr. Tony Fernandez, CBE, the degree of Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. the degree of Doctor of Science and Oris Kaiser. Thank you very much. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, Chancellor, Speedy Gregson, and Keith. Um, Thank you for reading my book. <laughs> uh, to all the graduates, congratulations. Uh, but more congratulations to the parents who must be feeling incredibly proud today uh, for what they've produced. And <clears throat> to all the faculty, I think faculty is always underplayed sometimes. It's for you that produce such wonderful graduates. I was looking through the program, actually, and uh, seeing what amazing stuff Cranfield does. So if you need a job, please apply at the end of this ceremony. I'll be taking all applications myself. <laughs> We've had a phenomenal ride in the last 16 years from two planes to now 230 planes, from 200,000 passengers when I first started this airline to actually this year we'll carry 90 million passengers. 60% of the routes that we do are routes that were never done before. As a Keith said, I had zero experience in the airline business. But it's been a fantastic ride. Just two or three stories to tell you. One, adversity will always strike. There will always be problems. But through problems, there will always be a silver lining. And I'll mention something Keith mentioned. When we started, well, we started just two days before 9-11, but our first major calamity, and we've had everything, bombs, terrorists, earthquakes, We've got a volcano now, Singapore Airlines, you name it, we've had it. And uh, we had something called SARS. No one wanted to fly. Everyone thought they would die if they flew. So I went to my marketing department and said, triple our advertising now. And they looked at me as though I was on drugs. And I wasn't on drugs. And they said, why would we do that? No one wants to fly. I said, it's the best time to build our brand because all the big airlines have cut their advertising. Plus, I knew Malaysians very well. If you put a fare low enough, they will risk their lives. Okay? At 800 ringgit, no one was going to fly. At 80, I'll take my chance. And so there's always an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to always find a way through. And I urge you all to dream, because from some dreams come some reality. If you don't dream, you'll never have that chance to live your life. And don't let anyone tell you you can't do what you want to do, because you can. And don't be afraid of failure, because if you don't try, you never know. And if you fail, you fail. You don't want to sit there at 55 and say, I wish I did that. As was eloquently said by Keith, I was sent to boarding school as a 12-year-old. I'd never been to England. And when I arrived at Heathrow Airport, even in the late 70s, was a huge airport compared to what I left in Malaysia. 
And I remember the first thing I thought, God, everyone's white here. I'd never seen so many white people. That doesn't happen anymore in Heathrow because when you arrive in Heathrow, everyone's Indian. So <laughs> you feel quite at home now, as I told my daughter. But, you know, I traipsed around to Epsom on a Green Line bus, arrived at Epsom College and thought, what have I done wrong to my parents that they sent me to such a place? But I had a great time. And they gave you this box called a tuck box where you put your life's possessions in them. And I put three stickers as my dreams as a 12-year-old. On the left-hand side, I had West Ham United. It was a football club I used to support. And because I always wanted to own a football club. In the middle was Qantas Airlines sticker because I always wanted to start an airline. It was always in my, my dream. And Freddie Laker was my idol in terms of starting the first low-cost airline. And on the right-hand side was a Formula One sticker, Williams Formula One team, because I wanted to own a Formula One team. And inside the box were music cassettes, because that was my dream, original music cassettes. I never bought pirated product. And further down, long way down, um, now much older, a little bit more wiser, someone returned that tuck box to me. And it was very emotional to me because I hadn't seen it for a long time. And I saw those dreams when I was a 12-year-old. And I achieved it. Not all very successful. I owned a Formula One team with Christian Horner. I was last at very, of almost every race. I only beat Richard Branson's team a few times, of which he lost a bet to me and had to be a stewardess, of which he loves because he loves cross-dressing anyway. And, but it wasn't the fact that we were last. It wasn't the fact that it wasn't success. It was the fact that I did it. I used to watch Formula One at Brands Hatch from outside Brands Hatch. I couldn't afford to go in. And there I was on my first race in Bahrain on the same track as Williams. So Frank Williams was my hero, as Ferrari, Red Bull, etc. So it didn't matter, I have no regrets that I lost a huge amount of money and that I didn't win a race, but I did it. Similar for Queen's Park Rangers, I tried to buy West Ham and failed miserably. And then Bernie Eccleston offered me Queen's Park Rangers. And it's been not a failure yet. Um, we've had our ups and downs, which are well reported. But as someone who listened to BBC World Service for radio, to sit there at Wembley Stadium to be completely outplayed by Derby and have one shot in the 89th minute when Bobby Zamora scored and to be at the pitch seeing 45,000 QPR fans happy. It was an amazing feeling. And finally, AirAsia obviously has had immense impact on my life, both good and bad. And so live your dreams. You're at a fantastic university that's given you a fantastic <coughs> education. I wasn't the best student in the world, but I'm sure take that knowledge you have, go out there, be the best in the world. Remember that it's not just about you, it's about a team. And that's what we've done so well at AirAsia. We've taken, there were no female pilots before in Malaysia. We now have 62 female pilots. I asked my chief pilot, why are there no female pilots? And he came up with a reason that can never be repeated in public. And I said, if a woman can run a country, she can certainly fly a plane. And the other day was history. Captain was female. Co-pilot was female. Chief engineer was female. All the cabin crew were female. And all the passengers were male. Um, that last bit's not true. So, so go out there. I better sit down before the Baroness tells me to sit down. Uh, we're an airline, so we're always on time. Got three minutes to speak, and I've spoken in three minutes. Believe the unbelievable, dare to dream, and never take no for an answer. Go out there, graduates of Cranfield, and be the best. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here.